So uh, Monday we have exam, whatever it is, for. Uh, the 21st. And that's everything up through circular motion. So I'd be happy to answer questions about practice problems today. Uh, and then uh, there's one more example problem I want to go through. Uh, and when we're done with all that, we'll go on to the next topic that isn't going to be on the test. Um, anybody have any practice problem questions? I know you do, because <laughs> we already talked about it. Yeah, does anyone have it in front of them? I need to have it in front of me. Okay, so circular motion practice problems. Number three, um, it says a one kilogram ball is attached to the top of a pole by a cable like tether ball. So is this a tether ball problem or not? That's the first thing. What's the thing that gives away that this is, you're going to do this like a tether ball problem? Yeah, when it says like a tether ball. That won't always be there, but if it is, you want to do it with the method of tether ball. Okay, so... Um, The mass is one kilogram. Um, the cable has a length of 1.5 meters. And it's traveling in a circular path. And during this motion, uh, the cable makes an angle of 30 degrees with the vertical, um, which means This angle is 30 degrees. Um, and we want to know what's the tension in the cable. And second, what's the speed of the ball? Um, for tether ball problems, we take a side view of the problem. So I'll do it over on this side. The cir you know, the circular path that the object moves in is like this, horizontal. We can't see the circular shape. Um, we know that this angle is 30 degrees, and so we know that this angle is 60 degrees. The coordinate system I'm going to put here. We've chosen the point on the path to analyze. Um, so the next thing we have to do is draw the direction of the centripetal acceleration vector from the object toward the center of the circle. So there's a centripetal. And a centripetal is equal to v squared over r in the direction we just figured out like that. Um, we don't know v. That's one of the things we're trying to calculate. 
Usually we know R, but in this case we don't know that yet either. So how are we going to figure out what R is? Trigonometry. 1.5 is the length of the cable. And so the way to use that is, um, yeah. Um, so if you know the length of this cable is 1.5, and you know that this angle is 60 degrees, then this part of the triangle, which is what we're trying to find. Um, okay, so first of all, let me give you a second to get your bearings here. So this is a side view of the circle. Okay, so the radius of the circle is the distance from here to the center of the pole. And so in this triangle, the radius is this leg of the triangle. Um, and you might be able to make sense out of that on your own if you think about this in terms of a vector and the x and y components of a vector. But you don't really have to make sense out of that. Um, the, the way to calculate that is just um, the hypotenuse times the cosine of this angle. So this is just 1.5 times the cosine of 60 degrees, which is, uh, I can't do that in my head. Ooh, can I? 12.99. What is it? <laughs> cosine, oh yeah, cosine of 60. That one's easier, yeah. Uh, Okay, so centripetal acceleration is V squared over 0 0.75. And it's going this way. So the X component of the vector is V squared over 0.75. And the Y component is 0. The total acceleration is the centripetal plus the tangential. Tetherball problems are always uniform circular motion, so the tangential acceleration is zero. And so the total acceleration is V squared over 0.75 for the x component, zero for the y component. And now we'll do a free body diagram. There's a weight of one kilogram times 9.81, so 9.81 newtons. And if I include a little stump of the cable, the force is that direction. And the magnitude of that force is the cable tension. We don't know that yet. We needed the 30 to come up with the 60. Uh, well, we are going to have to use it. Um, I was just about to write in here that we know that this angle is 60 degrees. And so we're going to use that to come up with the components of the force vector applied by the cable. So Newton's second law says um, this T uh, this force here is T times the cosine and sine of 60 degrees, because that's uh, a counterclockwise angle of 60 to get from the positive x-axis to the vector. And then the weight force is 0, negative 9.81. And that's equal to the mass times the acceleration. So
So the x equation says t times the cosine of 60 is 0.5t is equal to v squared over 0.75. That has two variables in it, so we can't solve for anything yet. And then the y equation says t times the sine of 60, that's 0.866t uh, minus 9.81 is equal to 0. So t is equal to 9.81 divided by 8.66. Can someone calculate that? Uh, 0.33? Okay, so 11.33 newtons is the cable tension. And then plug that into the x equation. And you get <laughs> 0.5 times 11.33 is equal to v squared over 0.75. So 0.5 times 11.33 times 0.75 is equal to v squared. Uh, so can someone calculate v squared or v? Two 2.06. Uh, meters per second. It's plus or minus because you're taking the square root and we want plus because it's a speed. <laughs> Any questions about that one? If I ask for the tension, then I just want the number. Okay. If I ask for the force, if I want the vector, I'll be specific about it. But if, if I did ask for the force that the cable applies to the ball, you would take that 11.33 and plug it back into this vector. Any other practice problems you'd like to see? Okay, there's one more uh, example I want to do. Okay, so back to non-uniform circular motion. Um, in a problem where you're given, so if you're given um, a starting speed an ending speed and an elapsed time You can use that to calculate the tangential acceleration magnitude. Um, and it's a formula that we've basically seen before. Um, I'm going to write it a little bit different, but you'll maybe recognize it. So the magnitude of the tangential acceleration is equal to the speed at the later instant minus the speed at the earlier instant divided by the change in t. This is the elapsed time.
Okay, so let me use that in an example. All right, so let's say that um, some kind of mechanical arm is spinning this mass around in a circle. Let's say the mass is 10 kilograms. And the arm, let's say, is, I don't know, 2 meters. So this is moving around in a circular path like this. Um, and let's choose a direction. Uh, so let's say it's going counterclockwise. Um, at the start of the motion, well, let's say the mass is at rest. And after five seconds, the mass has a speed of, uh, I don't know, 10 meters per second. Um, if the object is at the bottom of the circular path at five seconds. What's the net force acting on the mass at that instant? Um, all right, is this a tetherball problem? It looks a little like it, but um, for one thing, this is supposed to be rotating like this, so tetherball problems have to be horizontal circles. <coughs> and for another thing, um, this is a, you know, like a rigid arm, not a string. And the last thing is the speed is changing, so we know it can't be a tetherball problem. So no, we're going to use the analysis approach for all the other kind of stuff. And we want to choose a um, we want to choose a view of this problem where we can see the circular path. And next, we have to choose a point on the circle to look at. Well, we're in this problem, we're given a point that we have to look at. We're told that it's at the bottom of the circle at this instant. So that's the point we're looking at. Um, the next thing we have to do is figure out the direction of the centripetal acceleration. That points from the object toward the center of the circle, so that's the centripetal. Uh, the centripetal acceleration is equal to V squared over R um, in the positive Y direction. All right, do we know anything about 
V or R? Yeah, we know both of them. Uh, R is R is given. That's two. What about V? What V do we want to use? Yeah, we're doing it at the instant that it reaches 10 meters per second. So that's the speed we want to use for this. Even though you know there's a whole range of speeds during this motion, that's the one we want to use. Um, so this is 10 squared over 2, which is 50 meters per second squared in the positive y direction. And then in components, that's positive y, so that's 0, 50 in components. We have the centripetal acceleration, but this one is a non-uniform circular motion problem, so we need to figure out the tangential acceleration. Uh, it's moving counterclockwise, so the velocity of the ball is like this. And is it speeding up or slowing down? speeding up and so the tangential acceleration is in the same direction as the velocity and the magnitude of the tangential acceleration is the later speed which is 10 minus the earlier speed 0 divided by the elapsed time 5 and it's pointing this direction. So that's 2 meters per second squared in this direction. Or in components, that's 2, 0. <coughs> so now the total acceleration is equal to the centripetal plus the tangential, which is 0, 50, plus 2, 0, so 2, 50, any questions about that yet? And what we're really trying to figure out is the net force. So now we'll use Newton's second law. Uh, you don't have to draw a free body diagram if you're calculating the net force because the free body diagram just helps you break up the net force into individual forces. So I'm just going to write this as F net is equal to the mass. What did I say the mass was? 10. So 10 kilograms times the acceleration, 250. And so that's 20 newtons, 500 newtons. Yep? Gravity will have to go back now. Uh, so gravity is acting, but it's built into F net somewhere. Like we don't know all the forces. You know, this is equal to um, the force applied by the arm plus zero negative. 98.1 plus, you know, there's probably some bird droppings on it or whatever, and that weighs something. You know what I mean? But um, F net is you just take all the forces acting on it, lump them together, and that's why we don't need a free body diagram for this. Any other questions? It probably depends on the application, whether there's bird droppings. Uh, Okay. So that's all for circular motion. The next topic is conservation laws. And we're going to do two conservation laws. Um, the first one is conservation of linear momentum.
Um, and one of the things that gets sort of tricky around this part of the class, up until now, uh, there's really only been one way to do any kind of calculation that we're doing. This is where we start to have different choices of what approach to use, what's, you know, what's the relevant material for the problem you have to solve. Uh, when you use conservation of linear momentum is easy. Uh, conservation of linear momentum is useful just in collisions and explosions. So if you ever see a problem that has a collision in it or an explosion in it, you're going to use this. If it doesn't have those in it, you're not. You're going to use something else. And then the second conservation law is conservation of energy. Um, this one's a little trickier when to use. Um, so it's trickier to know when to use it. Um, but when we get to that, I'll, I'll talk about uh, a way to think about that. And before I get into the math of these, I want to talk about what conservation means in science. Um, so conservation means that a quantity stays constant. Um, so See this lady here? Uh, she's holding a trowel. And a little tree. And She's got long, center-parted hair and probably John Lennon glasses. And definitely like some kind of like peace medallion. Is that the peace symbol? Okay, so she's going around. I mean, she's a good person. It's good to go around. Uh, planting trees. That's what she's doing. She's planting these trees. It makes her happy. Um, <laughs> but she, so she's doing a lot of good things. I'm not trying to get down on her. But what she's not doing is conservation. This is not, she says she's a conservationist, but she's not. Every time she plants a new tree, she's uh, getting farther from keeping the number of trees constant. Okay? So this is not conservation. She's increasing the number of trees. So uh, I'm going to start with conservation of linear momentum. So one, conservation of linear momentum. <coughs> um, between any two instants, Um, 
Um, if a chosen system of bodies is acted upon by zero net force, uh, has zero net force acting on it, Uh, the total linear momentum of the system is conserved. Um, okay, so I have to define linear momentum. The linear momentum of an object is, uh, people call it lowercase p, I'm not sure why, I'm sure it's Latin or something, but the momentum is defined as the object's mass times its velocity. Uh, notice that this is, so notice. This is a vector quantity, so it has direction. Um, so with the definition of linear momentum, uh, Things that have a large amount of linear momentum are really big things moving really fast. So a semi-truck has a lot of momentum. Uh, football players benefit from being able to generate a lot of momentum, have a lot of momentum. The SI units for momentum are kilograms, meters per second. Um, okay, so if uh, two objects, it doesn't have to be two, it works with more than two, but we're, our calculations are always gonna be two. So if two objects have no net force acting on them, uh, let me call them, uh, how do I do this? so let's call them objects, well, let's, let's call them objects A and B for now. Two objects, A and B, have no net force acting on them. And uh, in parentheses, let's say, in the chosen coordinate system. Then the conservation of linear momentum says this. Um, the mass of A times the velocity vector of A plus the mass of body B times the velocity vector of body B before a collision is equal to the same thing after the collision, the mass of body A times the velocity of body A plus the mass of body B times the velocity of body B after the collision. Um, 
for us the left side of this equation will always represent the instant just before the collision I said explosions too, but I think our practice problems are all collisions. Um, so just before the collision, and the right side always represents uh, the instant right after the collision. So um, what this says is, all right, so let's, um, make up a scenario. So let's say, uh, there's a cart that has a mass of two kilograms. moving this direction at four meters per second. And then over here, there's a cart with a mass of one kilogram uh, moving this way at two meters per second. And we wanna know what are the velocities of these objects after the collision. Um, well, this equation says uh, the mass of the two kilogram object times its velocity vector before the collision. Uh, so two kilograms, this before the collision, it's moving at four meters per second in the positive x direction. So four zero plus the mass of the one kilogram cart times its velocity before the collision. That's two meters per second in the negative x direction, so negative two zero. Is equal to, uh, they're not gonna change masses in this collision, so it's equal to two, uh, So it's equal to two kilograms times, well, let's say just from looking at this that we know um, that these are, the motion is only gonna be in the x direction. You know, it might be positive and it might be negative, but let's write this as uh, V2, zero, plus the mass of the one kilogram times its velocity vector after the collision. And now we just have to solve that equation for those variables. There's a problem though. Um, so the x equation here says eight minus two is equal to two V two plus V one or six is equal to two V two plus V one. And the y equation says zero equals zero, so that doesn't help. So we get one equation for two unknowns. Uh, 
Um, and so let's just come up with a couple of what this means is there are a lot of solutions that different solutions that'll satisfy conservation of linear momentum. Uh, let me just give a couple. So, um, that says multiple solutions satisfy conservation of linear momentum. For example, um, V2 could be equal to zero, and V1 could be equal to six. That satisfies this equation. You get six is equal to zero plus six, so that works. Um, that says that these will hit each other. The two kilogram object will stop dead and the one kilogram object will bounce all the way back way faster than it came in, okay? Um, that doesn't sound very plausible, but that satisfies conservation of linear momentum. Or you could have V2 be equal to negative five meters per second And V1 equal to, what would that be? Uh, negative, uh, 16. So in this one, the two kilogram cart bounces back way faster than it came in. And the one kilogram cart bounces back way, way faster than it came in. And that also doesn't seem very plausible, but um, both of those two solutions satisfy conservation of linear momentum. Okay, so, so on. So the, the thing is, um, conservation of linear momentum is not enough to predict what the velocities are gonna be after the collisions. And if you think about, you know, the nature of collisions, this makes intuitive sense. Um, so think about what if these carts were made out of out of uh, Play-Doh. I think it might have an exclamation point, trademark. <laughs> Play-Doh brand uh, modeling clay. And then think about what would happen if these carts are made out of steel or something, you know, ceramic. So if they were made out of Play-Doh, they'd come in, they'd stick together, and then whatever they did, they'd do it all as a single unit, you know? They'd, they would end up, well, what we do know is that um, they would end up, uh, after the collision, the, the momentum of that whole mass that sticks together would be equal to six kilogram meters per second. And if they were steel, uh, they would bounce apart in some way. Um, whoops. Oh, 
Okay, so they're made out of Play-Doh. They stick together. If they're made out of steel, they bounce apart. And so when you think about it that way, it makes sense that their velocities after the collision would require more information about the nature of the collision, you know. Um, so predicting the velocities after, predicting the velocities after the collision requires information about the collision. Okay, so we're only going to do one type of collision. Uh, there are different ways to classify uh, collisions, but the only one we're going to do only collision type will do is called um, a perfectly inelastic collision. Um, a perfectly inelastic collision is one like the Play-Doh where the objects stick together after the collision. And if they stick together, so they stick together after the collision. And therefore their velocities after the collision are the same. By the way, uh, do you have a feel for what the word elastic means? It's, it's used in like everyday language. Uh, so this is not, this is a collision with no elasticity. Um, so like the elastic waistband on your underwear, like what makes it elastic? What makes it, what keeps it from being a perfectly inelastic waistband? So yeah, it stretches, but that's the key thing isn't the stretch. The key thing is when you let go of it, it returns. Um, you know, you could make uh, probably the first uh, Hanes underwear, they tried a perfectly inelastic waistband where it's like made out of clay or Play-Doh or something, you know? And you stretch it and it works fine. You're like, oh yeah, I can get these on great. But then when you let go, there's a problem, you know? Because it doesn't spring back. So um, in an elastic collision, the things come in, they hit, they deform as they press together. And then what makes an elastic collision is then they spring back apart and as they do that, they, they push away from each other. They, they pop back into their original shape and that pushes them back apart. And so what's happening here is these things are always going to come in, they're going to deform, but then they're not going to return to their original shape, and so they'll just stay as a single unit like that. Okay. Okay, so um, conservation of linear momentum with perfectly inelastic collisions. So I'm going to abbreviate conservation of linear momentum in perfectly inelastic collisions.
So the way this works is you have the mass of one object times its velocity vector plus the mass of the second object times its velocity vector before the collision. And those are equal to um, the sum of the masses because you can think of after the collision, instead of having two separate things with separate uh, linear momentums, now we just have a big blob of something that has the combined mass and it's traveling with a single velocity. So uh, the mass of A plus the mass of B times a single velocity vector after. Okay, so let me do an example. Uh, let's say there's a kid on a skateboard. He's an alien. <laughs> yeah, that does look like he has a helmet on. Um, he really is an alien. Um, and uh, let's say a ball is thrown to him. It, when it hits his hands, right before it hits his hands, it's moving horizontally at 15 meters per second. Uh, the mass of the ball is 0.4 kilograms. The mass of the kid is 50 kilograms. Ooh, that's a big kid. <laughs> this kid has some serious problems. That's, yeah, if he had a normal head, he'd be like 20 kilograms. That would be more reasonable. Um, after he catches the ball, Uh, what's the velocity? He's at rest. He's just standing there. Yeah. Okay, so um, conservation of linear momentum says... Uh, and I'm going to use the usual coordinate system. So uh, the mass of the ball times its velocity vector before the collision. Uh, before the collision, it's moving in the positive x direction. So that's 15, 0, plus the mass of the kid times his velocity vector before the collision. He's at rest, so this is just 0, 0. And that's equal to the combined mass, 50.4. times the velocity vector after the collision. So we're going to solve for both of those two components. Um, this is a problem where, you know, it doesn't make much sense for the, uh, for the velocity of a y component, but we can solve for it, and we'll just solve for the fact that that's equal to zero. Okay, so the x equation says... 0.4 times 15 plus 0 is equal to 50.4 Vx. And um, 
So 6 divided by 50.4 is equal to Vx. Vx is equal to uh, 0.119 meters per second. And then the y equation says 0 plus 0 is equal to 50.4 Vy. So Vy is equal to 0. And so the velocity after the collision is 0 0.1190. Or if you wanted to think about it as a direction, um, that's in the positive x direction. So the velocity is this way at 0.119 meters per second. Um, So what would happen if the mass of the kid was smaller? It was a smaller kid. What if he had a normal head? Would the <laughs> velocity be bigger or smaller after the collision? It would be bigger. And if the kid was more massive, uh, it would be a smaller velocity. And the opposite works with the ball. If the ball had more mass before the collision, they'd be moving faster after the collision. If it had less mass, they'd be moving slower after the collision. Um, we're not going to do elastic collisions, uh, and I'm going to. There are a bunch of practice problems that deal with elastic collisions, but we're just going to skip that. Um, anyone have a feel for what would? So, what if that? So the ball came in at uh, 15 meters per second. It had the same mass. He has the same mass. He tried to catch it, but instead it bounced off his giant head and bounced bounced away. Okay. The kid would roll back with some velocity, right? Do you have a feel for would that the velocity that he rolls back at, would it be bigger or smaller than 0.119? It would be bigger. Yep. In fact, uh it would be twice as big. And the way you can sort of make sense out of that, we're not going to do these calculations, but before the collision, all of the momentum is the ball, right? The kid sitting there, he doesn't have any velocity, so he doesn't have any momentum. So the, all the momentum of the system is the ball going this way. If the ball bounces off after the collision, the ball has momentum going back the other way. But the ball and the kid still have to <coughs> add up to a momentum of, you know, the momentum the ball had before the collision. So the kid's momentum going that way has to make up for the fact that the ball now has momentum that way. <coughs> it's a vector thing. So, like, if the ball was bouncing back at, let's say the ball bounced back at 5 meters per second, then the ball afterwards would have a momentum of negative negative two kilogram meters per second, the kid would have to have momentum the other way that made up for that. I've heard uh, somebody, one of my a high school physics teacher uh, said that that's the reason they use rubber bullets. Rubber in, you know, is because um, it, the, the fact that the bullets are elastic um, makes them more effective at knocking people down, you know? I'm sort of like, I don't know. It, it is true that this effect would would give rubber rubber bullets that bounce that effect, but I, I think the idea is that they're, they don't kill you as often. Isn't that pretty much it? I mean, a bullet, a bullet that goes into your body is like super, super bad for you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's do one that's not all in a line. So 
So let's say you have an object. Um, with a mass of one kilogram. Uh, before a collision, it's moving at five meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees below the horizontal. And it collides with a second object that before a collision is moving at six meters per second horizontally, say that as a mass of two kilograms. If the objects stick together what's the velocity after the collision? Um, so conservation of linear momentum says take the mass of the first one times its velocity before the collision. Um, to figure out the, the vector components for this velocity, what angle would you use <coughs> for this? Negative 30 or positive 330. So that's five times cosine and sine of negative 30 which is 4.33, negative 2.5. And then the second one before the collision has a mass of 2. It's moving in the positive x direction, so the velocity vector is 6, 0. And after the collision, they have a combined mass of 3, and we're going to calculate both of those velocity components. So the x equation says 4.33 plus 12 is equal to 3vx. So 16.33 is equal to 3vx uh, – can someone calculate that? 5.443. And the y equation – it's not going to be 0 this time uh, – says negative 2.5 plus 0 is equal to 3vy. So vy is equal to 2.5 divided by 3 uh, point eight three three. Yes, negative. Point eight three repeating. And so the final velocity vector is 5.443, negative 8 point, nope, yeah, negative 0 0.83 repeating. Or in other words, uh, you know, it goes horizontally 5. Um, down 0.83, so sort of in this direction. <coughs> Any questions about that? Um, you could also use this equation. Uh, you know, most of the practice problems you'll know the velocities of the things before the collision and calculate after. But you can also do it 
you know, it's just a matter of matching the number of variables with the number of equations. So you can also do it where you know the, the velocity after and you calculate something about the velocities before, or you can do it where you know velocities before and after and calculate the masses. It's just a matter of having enough equations for the variables. Okay, that's all.